this is uh, quite a uh, complex subject, so I'm not going to do this uh, in very much technical language, and I'm going to try and keep it simple. But before I delve into the content, I uh, just want to thank uh, the uh, Platinum sponsors for the opportunity to be here, Magenta Global, uh, Honorable Ministers and Delegates and fellow exhibitors. Thanks for being here. I think it was a wonderful two days. Thanks for the opportunity of sharing a bit of our insight with you. And uh, as I said, I'll be trying to keep it uh, interesting and fast. I'm going to run through the content. So uh, feel free to put up your hand. Uh, stop me if I'm going too fast. Uh, I'm sure everyone is tired. We had a big, lovely lunch. So uh, let me get right into it. Um, Managing risks through the feasibility phase to determine sufficient capital contingency for implementation. This is a very, very big subject. Uh, so, I'm, unfortunately, I'm going to talk in circles today. Uh, but hopefully, I will be taking you with me on the journey. Um, so, uh, I'm trying to use something interesting. So, let's get right onto it in terms of introduction. Who am I? Uh, thank you for the introduction. My name is Edouard Peterson. I'm from South Africa. I'm a risk manager. and uh, who is Bibicom and Bibicom Projects? Well, Bibicom Projects is but one of a group of companies specializing in mining. We have got an uh, uh, open pit design house, we've got an underground design house, we've got ourselves, which is the project management and the risk management simulation arm. We've got a branch in Namibia and we've got a specialist rehab service as well. So we're a group of companies for mining, from mining, in the mining. Um, and more specifically, Bibicom Projects, the company that I, that I represent. What do we specifically do? Well, there you have it. We specialize in all forms of risk management. Uh, and today's talk is about quantitative risk management, although I'm not going to go into the maths, uh, but we do various other support functions re uh, related to mining projects as well. Um, but not to delve into that any, any longer. So, uh, in terms of talking in circles, the topic, as I said, we're going to talk today about risks and mining feasibility studies and specifically how that impacts capital. If you want to take a project to implementation, uh, what is that magical figure that you need to go ask the banks and the private equity providers for? So, we're going to talk about that. So, why specifically this topic? Well, I think risk management is sort of a grudge function. I think a lot of people feel, you know, it doesn't add value, something that you have to do. Um, but I truly believe that it does add value. Um, so and I, hopefully I'm going to shed a little bit of light on that topic today. Hopefully if I can keep you awake, I will be able maybe to share you a bit of my passion on the subject. Um, and even if you don't remember anything, please remember this that there is no single magic figure. Every figure that you see, every capital number, every, every number that comes out from a mineral economic study, either explicitly or tacitly, there's risk associated with that number. Now the question is, do you know what that risk is? At what confidence level is that number being picked? And that's sort of the gist of my, of my discussion today. So if there's one thing that you need to take away, is be careful of single point numbers. Just be careful of that. Always ask the probing question of risk. What is the risk line behind this number? Okay, great. Is everyone still with me? Can I see some hands? Is everyone still awake? Great, okay, great, great. Good, good, good. Moving on. Just quickly some key concepts when we talk about this uh, the subject. Not sure if everyone is familiar, but there is a framework out there that does govern risk management in its broader sense. Uh, it's the ISO 31000 framework. And uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about, a bit about it, just a little bit. Um, but I just want to drop that there, that there is something that governs uh, risk management processes. Because we're talking feasibility, we're actually talking within the broader scope of asset development, the asset development life cycle, and the risk that you need to manage going through that process. Um, now, within the broader asset development, you've got various phases, and I'm going to be zoning in on a specific part of that, the feasibility phase and how do you take that going forward. So the asset development life cycle, the elements of typically of a capital estimate coming from your WBS, 
But uh, I'm not sure everyone is aware that there's also elements coming from the schedule, uh, some discrete risks that you need to manage as well, point risks, uh, and then obviously uncertainty in your capital estimate itself. How do you take that forward on a probabilistic basis? And then obviously how do you determine your, your contingency? At the end of the day, you want to picture at a certain uh, percentile, and you want to know, given that base estimate, what do you need to, to add to that to sufficiently pad for the risk that you're comfortable with? So those are just some of the key, key concepts. Um, and a quick touching on, on it, delving into it a little bit more detail. As I said, the ISO 3000 process is really about two important things. It's about first context. You need to know where you are. What are you busy with? Who are you dealing with? That's the first most important thing about ISO 3000. And the second most important thing is that it is a continuous process. It doesn't stop. You never arrive. You're always managing risks. Risks are always falling away. You're always adding new risks. So if you think about a mining project, it's always a continuous process. Continuous process up to a point, and even post that investment point, there's still risk. You need to constantly adjust and find for that. So that's quite important, when, especially when you're in the feasibility phase. There's no better time than the present to do a risk assessment when you're in the feasibility phase. I'll show you where we did in our specific case study where we did risk assessments and, and why we did that. But once again, there's never a better time than the present. Risks are always emerging. I think also the very important thing to remember is that uh, you need to manage your risks while you have the opportunity. At a certain point, risks will emerge, but you won't have the ability to really influence that. Um, if we talk about the life cycle, as you can see there, you know, at a certain point you start to really, when your investment is being made, you're already committed. Um, so in terms of cost, when your investment is going up, you really need to be very sure of, of, uh, of the risk that you've accepted at that point. Are they explicitly or you know, if you're not sure about it, you've already, already factored that in. So you cannot wait for perfect inf information, as I said. Um, there's no better time than the, than the present. So typically, not, in, not to be academically correct, but just very quickly, typically in a, in a feasibility phase, uh, you know, at some point you need, you need a resource, um, you need to give that resource to the mining engineers. They take that through an optimization process to get to an economically optim uh, optimal uh, reserve. Uh, at some point, you also need to factor in, you know, in terms of your recoveries and how that could have, how that's going to work and influence the economics of your project. Um, then, then engineers start getting involved and they start running with them. They start developing and designing the whole, the whole asset. Um, and then at some point, you start getting numbers and figures from all over. You get capital numbers, you get operational expense numbers. Um, so how do you manage those numbers? How accurate are they? Can you bank on them? And how do you assess the risk that is inherent in some of those quotes that you're receiving? And all of that obviously factors into your techno-economic analysis. Um, and then comes that magic number, that magic investment number. But do you know at what percent or what risk that number is sitting? So what we propose is that throughout this process, you need to be executing, doing active risk management. There are certain ideas that I have about where times are better to do it, but you should be actively identifying and managing risks throughout that process. So in this specific case study, uh, how did we do it? Um, not sure if you can read there, but there are a few dates there. This was a fairly uh, quick feasibility study that we did. Um, and basically, it started with a kickoff. In, uh, in January, and after the process was running, and all the technical disciplines were uh, fully up to speed with uh, what's going on, we did a, a qualitative risk assessment, looking at the feasibility phase itself, asking the question, what risk and opportunities need to be managed throughout the feasibility phase to make sure that the feasibility itself realizes its objective. So that was the first quantitative risk assessment that we did. Then when the feasibility study entered 
in its closure stages, when there were, was a lot more certainty about what the asset is going to be, we then enter into a second qualitative risk assessment, where we ask the question again, well, now, if we take this asset forward, what are the risks that we're going to have to manage to deliver this asset? We've designed it now, and we've optimized our design, and we've, kept, we've, we've capitalized on what opportunities, but what opportunities do we manage going forward, and what risks do we manage going forward? So we did a second qualitative risk assessment. Out of that, we got our discrete risks. That's our first, our first building block, our discrete risks. Then, obviously, as I said, the engineers got involved, and we got our, what we call our, our capital estimate, our bill of materials, um, and that was the magic number. Well, that's our second building block, our capital estimate. So we got that, and then obviously, that specific asset needs to be developed, it needs to be built, executed, so we got our implementation schedule. That was our third building block, our implementation schedule. And then out of those three building blocks, our discrete risks, our schedule risks, and our, our specific risks inherent to the capital and the bill of materials, we then calculated, we did a quantitative risk assessment, and then we calculated our contingency. Well, we calculated a range of contingencies, and then we obviously set up with the owners and uh, pegged the contingency which was appropriate for their, their risk capital life. So just quickly explaining a little bit more in terms of that. So first of all, this is typically, it's not very legible, but this is typically how a risk register looks. We've identified across a range of risk categories, various discrete risks that will influence this project. <coughs> Having identified all the mitigations and the controls appropriate, we went forward to quantify the loss events. And I'll show you a little picture about that. So the specific risk events and what is their expected loss should they occur, we also identified at the point in time when they most probably will occur. But we've identified those times and those losses, not as point estimates, but as three-point estimates. So you have a high confidence idea of what that loss event might be, you have a maximum idea of that loss event, and you have a minimum idea of that loss event. So you create a bit of a range for yourself, a little bit of space where you can play with. And we did that for all these specific discrete risk events in the time horizon when you're going to implement this asset. So that was our discrete risks. That point over there. Then we went to our capital bill. Here's just a quick snapshot of typically some of the some of the elements that you'll get from your engineers. Your engineers will obviously design your whole asset. They will cost it. They will go out into the market, get quotes. Um, those quotes for various components of the bill of materials. Um, some of them will be firm quotes with 90 days validity. Some of them with 180 days validity. Some of them will just be guesstimates from suppliers, stabs in the dark. Um, so you need to sit with the engineers and determine which of these quotes, which of these uh, these prices are fixed and firm, and what are the risks? You know, what are what is sitting behind this these numbers? Uh, you need to work through some of the contract conditions. You also need to work through some of the, the specific commodities uh, that are sitting behind these numbers. So we've got various. Uh, we've got some questionnaires that we ask the engineers. And once again, out of each of these line items, we then take the point number and we generate a range around it. Well, might this number increase a little bit? If so, what is that, that number that it might increase to? And what, what confidence are you that what that maximum might be? We also ask, well, is there maybe a potential reduction, opportunity for reduction in the specific line item? And if so, how much reduction might we experience and how confident are we that we might have a reduction in that. So basically we work through the capital, the whole capital bill, we ask probing questions, we document the assumptions um, very specifically for each of that and now we have a big bill with the varying ranges of capital costs. So that is our second building block for our contingency calculation. Is everyone still with me? Yeah. I'm moving very fast. I'm moving very fast. Alright, if I'm too fast, shout. The third last component, as I said, is our implementation schedule. Now this is where the project managers have sat down with the engineer and they have now scheduled this asset, this mine which we're going to develop. How are we going to deploy it? Where are we going to start? What are we going to do? At what points are things going to run concurrently? Well, bottlenecks in the schedule 
So we then work through that schedule. And once again, we look at the integrity of the schedule. Are there any hanging tasks? Um, we look at the critical part of the schedule. And then we once again ask the question about these critical activities and the near critical activities. How certain are we on the durations? Who and what information was used to determine that specific duration? And there, once again, we create a very pessimistic and a very often optimistic view on that specific duration of that task. And we work through that schedule very patiently and entering specific these three point estimates for the durations. So now we've had those three, those three building blocks which I referred to. You had your discrete risks, you had your, your bill of materials, and you had your uh, implementation schedule. Now what we then do is we switch on our Monte Carlo engine and we start generating a histogram of potential values. So this is now our discrete risks, our specific loss events. So we run typically 5,000 iterations and we get a spread of what is the value, the specific total loss which might occur, incur given a certain confidence. Um, and you can't see that there, but there were some, some expert figures given and we plotted those expert figures against the histogram. So that's one of the building blocks which we then generate. The second thing is we do the exact same for the capital bill. We have our point number now, which is our sum total of our, of our capital estimate, and we do our Monte Carlo through that as well. And once again there, we get a feel for the elasticity in the, uh, in the capital profile. Once again, we can plot our point estimate relative to the histogram, and we get a feel for that. And then, in terms of the schedule, we do a Monte Carlo on the schedule as well, but here, you don't get a range of, of monetary values like in the previous two years, you get a range of dates. So you have a base date, well, a proposed base date of when this mining project will be uh, going live, when it will be putting its first ore on rail, uh, whatever might be relevant. And now, given the uncertainties which we've added into the schedule, you get a range of dates. So your base date might be setting somewhere, but now you get a range of dates. So what we then do is, this is a bit of a fudge. We then sit down and we look at some of the major contracts and we ask the question, you know, what's the carrying cost of this project for a week's delay, for a month delay? It's very difficult and you can split hairs at this point. Um, but you come to a generally agreed number of the, the P's and G's and the carrying cost of the project at this point in time. Um, for a week's delay, for a month delay, two, two months delay, what is the value in terms of standing time that you're going to incur, the loss that you're going to incur if this project is delayed? So given those three building blocks, we then generate various, um, we generate a table with various probable figures. Um, now you don't have to use the same uh, percentile right through, it doesn't really matter. All that this does, it shows you the elasticity and it shows you the spread of the potential numbers that you have for those various capital elements. And then we sit down with management and based on their appetite and their profile, we then discuss. We also look at obviously, you know, the, the funders and what's the appetite of the funders. And then we work through that and then we agree with them on what are, what are the, the numbers that you need to add to your base estimate to sufficiently account for the three building blocks of risk. So there you have your base estimate at a specific number, and then you add uh, the figure for your capital estimate, your bill. You've added a figure, not very legible, unfortunately. You add the figure that added for your schedule, and you also add the figure for your discrete risk events that you need to add to that at a given confidence, at a given percentile, and that becomes your contingency profile. That now obviously excludes figures and then escalation and all of that. That's a different a subject for a different day, but just in terms of calculating and putting a little bit more rigor into your into your contingency calculation. I'm not sure if you can read that, but it gives you an idea. When we translated our scheduled delays into monetary cost, given a certain percentile, um, there's our discrete loss events 
These are unfortunately random numbers, but you can obviously do that in any denomination. Uh, and your capital ball numbers, and then give you a little contingency, and obviously calculate just the percentage of the base base estimate. So there's the capex, there's the schedule, and there's the external discrete component. It gives you a little nominal excluding installation. There you go. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a quick, very quick run through of this topic. So now going into statistics and mathematics. Are there any questions? None. Well then. Great. I hope that those of you who are traveling back, let us try that. Yeah. No.